2019. Let's say that we get started here. So first of all, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're from. Welcome to the January 2022 PowerShell Community Call. First of all, hello, welcome, and happy new year to everyone. Hope you had a, a nice safe and a, a nice restful holiday. And we are all back and we're certainly ready to get started. So um, <coughs> this community oh, call is, oh, that's okay. <laughs> no, no, I wanted to make sure we're recording and that we are, we're gonna get a copy of the chat because we, yeah. We're gonna try on the copy of the chat and we are recording. Okay, sorry. And so um, again, welcome to the PowerShell community call. Now as the PowerShell community call, this is where we all gather to discuss all things related to PowerShell and take care of its care and feeding. And to start off this, this, this brand new year, and we do have an action packed agenda, but to start off this brand new year, I'm kind of working with a couple of themes that I'm going with. And one of the themes that I'm working with is, I think that all ideas are worth discussion and debate. So let's keep in mind that there are humans attached to those text messages that we keep sending back and forth. And so let's be kind and keep in mind our code of conduct here for the community call and in GitHub and other places, all that kind of good stuff. So for our action packed agenda, and one of the things that I wanted to do, and maybe I can do it here is, um, if you would like to see the agenda and if you would like to post a question during the community call, please feel free to jump out to our GitHub and I'm going to drop the link into the chat um, where you can find the issue that we have and you can post your questions in there. Please feel free to post them um, as we go through this. And let's go ahead and get started with our action packed agenda today. So first on the list is is Hey, we shipped PowerShell 7.2, yay, for the holidays. Hope you enjoyed that for the holidays. And thank you for your feedback that you're giving us. We encourage you to give us feedback um, as, as we move forward. And speaking of moving forward, as you've come accustomed to, we don't, we don't rest too long. And so we're already starting on PowerShell 7.3. And Aditya, are you online today? Yes, you are. I see you down yep. there. Because Aditya, I, this is a great time for us to kind of go to you. We haven't we haven't issued a preview yet for PowerShell 7.3. So why don't you kind of update us on what we're going to be doing? We have already published preview one, but the announcement ah, which I did. wanted to make today was uh, we are going to focus on our engineering system for this month, and we won't be publishing a preview two for the month of January. So we'll be skipping January, but uh, we'll be back on track uh, from February. Thanks for correcting me. So I knew that we were going to ship one in January. So, so we're going to ship um, uh, 7.3.2, if I have you correct, in preview February two. is what the plan is. Yep, preview two will come out in February. Oh, that's awesome. So we will continue our march, and we look forward to your feedback on that. Along that same vein, and I, uh, you know, I, I open up VS Code every single day. I'm sure a lot of you do uh, as well, and VS Code has been treating me very well lately. And so, Andy, let me ask you, um, do we have a VS Code update in our future? We do have a VS Code update, not only uh, to talk about here, but also upcoming in the future. I'm probably going to ship out a new preview Monday, I'm going to guess. I'm going to call it Monday. Um, but yeah, if I've got a few minutes. We've actually got quite a bit to share here about VS Code. Yeah. So let me pull Love up to know note. what you're going to ship. So um, first, I want to point out that we've actually got four releases since our last community call. Um, this is almost all in the preview channel. We did do one stable release in December as well. Uh, that was using the same code that had existed. It just needed a bit of an update. But we've got, other than that, three preview releases out since the last call where we keep shipping those pretty regularly. This really demonstrates how good like our automatic build pipeline is now. Um, that lets us get all these releases out and people get to use them and we get to get bug fixes in and then back out to users. So thank you for helping us uh, test that preview. And I'm going to keep asking you to test the preview because um, we really need it. There will be a big release sometime in a few months. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, before I go too much further, I do want to thank Justin to, for stepping up 
uh, Justin Groot. I, are you on the call, Justin? He stepped up as a community maintainer with us, both with PowerShell editor services and on the extension. He's been saving me a whole hell of a lot of work helping people who file or issues. Um, he's also submitted several great bug fixes and a couple features. Um, so thank you, Justin, for joining us a little more officially as a co-maintainer of PowerShell editor services and the extension. Um, really appreciating his work as well as Patrick's work as well. Patrick has been um, really instrumental in me continuing to get these releases out and bugs fixed. Um, speaking of bugs getting fixed, I think you will all be really pleased to hear that all of our tests are re-enabled. So during the huge rewrite of the pipeline work, which if you've been following the extension, you've heard about probably for a few years now, um, the preview release currently has the giant pipeline rewrite finished. That's actually in um, PowerShell Editor Services version three. That's in the preview version of the extension. Essentially, it means that we don't really have deadlocks anymore. We now like actually can sequentially queue PowerShell tasks and execute them, which you know the extension asks the LSP, like the editor services, to do a lot of. Um, we used to not really know when these tasks were happening and they'd stomp on each other. We now actually have like a queue to run them. Uh, it's it That sounds simple, but it was really complicated. It's in, it works. Um, the bad news was as we were emerging that we just, we had to turn off a lot of tests, just uh, like high level functionality work, but our unit tests weren't ready to go. There were also a lot of tests turned up, turned off in like the original rewrite to use the Omnisharp library. Um, so like I got to this project last year and went, oh, where are all the tests? They're just off, they're commented out, they're disabled or skipped. Um, but as of the last preview that went out, uh, everything but one test was disabled. Um, enabled one test was still disabled so all the tests were like building and running again and in the next preview i even have that bug fixed and the disable is not there anymore so uh, that helps me feel a lot more confident about being able to fix your bugs and issues that you bring in i i'm sure that it seemed a little slow like you file a bug report and i'm like well i can't fix this just yet i'm just working on tests i needed those tests running so that when i fix your bug i don't introduce a new regression um, but the good news is that work is done uh, so we're we're going to be able to actually get to some of the higher level issues on the VS Code repo right now. So that's fantastic. Um, one more thing I want to mention is that if you are testing the preview of the extension, you're also testing the latest preview of PS Readline. We've got the I believe that's 220 beta 5 is in there. Um, so it's a double whammy. Install our extension, help us test previews of uh, both versions of this. And lastly, the, the last preview release that went out had at least a dozen separate bug fixes included in it. We just wanted to highlight that. So if you tried the preview recently-ish and it wasn't working very well, um, go ahead and try the preview again, please. It's gotten even better. Uh, we're really ramping up on the preview. It's getting close to stable. I don't want to give a timeline here, but it, it's starting to work well. Um, I think we only have maybe a dozen high level issues we still want to work through before we like move it into stable. Um, and those are big issues. I'm not going to lie, like preview is still a little buggy, but eventually it's going to move out into the stable channel. And if you're not using it before then, well, you know, use it before then so we know what your issues are and can fix them first. Um, so that would be great. Uh, yeah, that was my last big shout out. Test out the preview release for us. Thanks so much. Hey, great, Andy. Um, let me let me just confirm with you. Was that um, you? You're you're thinking. I'm not going to hold you to this, but you're thinking you might get the new preview out on Monday. I'm going to get a new version of the preview out on Monday. There's a, a couple okay. bug fixes went in this week. Um, I was thinking about doing it yesterday, but I have a feature ish that I want to get in today or tomorrow, and, and then we'll have a preview out on Monday. Um, so you know, just keep expecting those. I mean, we've been doing it every few weeks at this point. It, it's pretty easy. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled for a new preview. Awesome. Hey, folks, hey, I want there's to a question in the chat for you. For you. Oh, yeah. Pull that up. Yeah, I'm going to step away from the. Is there any plans to the ability to tap the parameters in VS Code? Um, I, go ahead and file an issue against us so I can dig into this. Uh, I, I mean, there is tap completion, um, but yeah, file an issue and we can talk about this a little more in depth. Cool, thanks, Andy. Folks, I'm going to step away from the agenda for just a second. Uh, I don't mean to put him on the spot, but I don't know if everyone or if we've had a chance for everyone to meet uh, our new PM lead, Michael Green. And a lot of you already know Michael from DSC and working with Azure Policy Guest Config, those kind of things. You've seen him in PowerShell. He's been in PowerShell for a long time. 
and now he's running our team. And Michael, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to see if you wanted to say good morning and say hello to everyone. Sure. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I, just looking at the attendee lists, most of you I think I have met over the years at conferences or presented with you. And uh, I'm, I'm very much humbled um, and, and really enjoying the opportunity to lead such a great and enthusiastic and passionate group of PMs and look forward to someday being able to see you all in person again, hopefully uh, in the near future. So thank you very much for uh, your, your continued enthusiasm and for um, the opportunity to be at your service. Yeah, the PM team is very excited to work with Michael, and we are all very excited to get out and start to see everyone at conferences. So we're really looking forward to it. Hope you are too, as well. Now, back to the agenda. PowerShell Get is something that we've been working on, PowerShell Get version 3.0, something we've been working on for quite some time. Anam, do you want to talk to us about Preview 12? Hey, yes, Jason, I shall. So let me share my screen. So in early December of last year, we released a preview version of PowerShell Get. It was right around the holidays, so um, we're going to talk about it in this community call. So for a full list of changes, you can obviously go to the change log, um, or you can also go to the blog post that we have for this preview release. Um, and basically, this preview release brings us one step closer to being feature complete. So we aim to have that done soon. Um, basically, it introduces or it includes more parameters and parameter sets that um, for certain commandlets. So for the find PS resource commandlet, we now include the tag and type parameter set as well as the command name and DSC resource name parameter sets. So it just gives you more ways to search for packages based on the different resource types. Um, we also include a destination path parameter for published PS resource. So you can basically publish with uh, and be able to specify the location you wish to have it published to. We also include no clobber functionality for installing as well as um, a as NEPCAG and include XML parameters for save PS resource. So you can save your packages um, as different files or including different files based on what you want. Um, there's also a skip dependency parameter check that we've added for installing and related operations. So if you want to ignore the dependencies, you now have an easy way to do that. So a lot of new parameters, or not new, but parameters that we've had in the past, parameters and parameter sets that we've had in the past are now completed. Um, and we also have better wildcard support. So previously we had wildcard support for the name parameter for certain commandlets. Um, and now we also have it for the repository parameter. So let's take a look at that. So let me first see the repositories I have registered. Now, if I wanted to search for a package, say PowerShell get, this is going to basically search through all the repositories in order of priority. And as soon as it finds it in that first repository, it'll just return from there and it's not going to continue going through the rest. Let's say I did want to search through all the repositories that I have registered and maybe see all the different versions that I have installed or sorry, all the versions that are there across the different repositories. I can now do that. So I'm going to just do that again for the same command. I'm going to actually add the type module. Um, words just to limit my search a bit more. And then I'm going to include repository star. So this will search across all the repositories and you can use you know, text with the wildcards as well. And this is gonna find the PowerShell get package in the PowerShell gallery repository, but it'll keep searching. And it'll also find it in the Posh test gallery repository. And it would have found it in whatever other repositories have this package too. So you kind of get a picture across multiple repositories or a bigger set of repositories if you would like. Um, so adding the wildcard to the repository parameter has been pretty cool. Um, in addition to that, we also have more consistent preview versioning support. So let's take a look at this package AZ SQL that I have installed. So as you can see, I have a couple of versions and we are also now displaying the preview uh, tag for packages in our display of the objects that are returned from the commandlets. So one thing to note with preview versions is that per NuGet version rules, 
um, a preview release is actually lower than a stable release. So if I also had, or if I was considering this package with version 3.0.0-preview against, let's say the same package with version 3.0, and that's the stable one, 3.0.0-preview would be a lower version in comparison. Um, so that's just something important to note because that's the rules or commandlets are following. So let's say I wanted to uninstall this version with our current preview. Oops. So with our current preview versioning support, you actually have to specify the full version that you're trying to uninstall. So if I specify uh, version 3.0.0 preview, it knows to go get this version. If I specified this version, so just the version part, and I didn't include the preview tag or the preview label, sorry, it is actually not going to uninstall this version. So we can take a look at this. So as you can see, I still have uh, AZ SQL 3.0.0 preview still installed. It wasn't able to uninstall it. Now, if I do provide the full version, and that includes the preview tag, it should go ahead and uninstall this one. Sorry, it's just taking a second <laughs> on my machine. After it thinks After about it for a minute. Yeah, it's actually going to run into an issue because I forgot to include the skip dependency parameter because I forget this one has a skip dependency. But if I do that again, yep, that goes much faster. So as you can see, it's gone ahead and it has uninstalled that version. So let's say I install this again just because I want to show you guys how the version range works. OK, so we have those versions again. Now, let's say I wanted to uninstall over a range of versions. And let's say the version range that I specified was 3.0.0 to 3.5.0. Like I said before, per NuGet versioning rules, the stable version 3.0.0, or sorry, per NuGet versioning rules, the preview version 3.0.0 preview is actually going to be less than the stable version 3.0.0. So this version won't get included in this version range and it wouldn't be installed. So that's just something useful to know when you're using the version range if you feel like maybe it's acting. Like you wouldn't expect, um, just try to remember that it is following those new good versioning rules. Yeah. Then if we take a look at it, we see that version 3.0.0 preview is actually left untouched as we expected. So those were some of the changes that we did include um, in the current preview release. Another thing that's important to note is that we have addressed a lot of, we've tried to address a lot of the feedback from the community. So thank you guys so much for being so vigilant with that and just really sharing what you thought of our preview release. Um, from the previous preview release, we did address community feedback about wanting more support for local file paths when you're registering a repository. So we do have better support for that. Um, we also have support for the scenario where, let's say you're installing a package and you're reinstalling it so it does already exist on your machine 
and you're reinstalling it and for whatever reason it fails, um, in that case we do go back and we restore the package that was being attempted to be reinstalled. Um, so we do kind of restore what we were uh, tampering, or not tampering with, but like changing. Um, and then, um, yeah, just better error handling in general. Um, we do plan to address some more bug fixes for this current or for the upcoming preview release. Um, there are also some commandlets related to module manifests and script uh, file info that we do want to implement. Um, that was present in V2. We also want to address some community feedback. So I think Justin Grody had brought up a good um, scenario of the install happening asynchronously. So that is something we want to address before GA as well. Um, and there's also a lot of other feedback from the community that we are working to address. Yeah. Great. Thanks, and I really like the wildcard on the location. Personally, that's going to help me out a lot, but it seems like we did a lot of work in there. So thank you so much. Thanks. I see um, there's a question from Joel yeah. that I'll address really fast. So they ask if it works, if they will write 3.0-A uh, to 3.5 as the version. So if you have an exact version where the A is the preview label, then it will work. But if you're kind of using it as a wild card, so if you're doing 3.0 dash star, um, it will not work in that case. So that exact preview label does have to exist for the version for it to work. Great, thank you. Um, now for a little bit more on PowerShell Get and the NuGet provider. Amber, do you have some updates for us today? Yeah, sorry. So this um, this isn't quite an update, but this is um, kind of a bug that's come about with PowerShell Git uh, version 1.0.0.1. Um, and basically what's happening there is um, uh, PowerShell Git v1 doesn't actually ship with the NuGet provider um, in package management. Um, so what happens with that version is that it tries to bootstrap the NuGet provider whenever it needs it. So for example, um, uh, commandlets like install, find, publish are all going to need the NuGet provider. Um, and so it's going to try to bootstrap that through um, oneget.org. And so we basically have a CDN that has the uh, blob files for the NuGet provider uh, to, for quick access to download. Um, but what happened there is a couple months ago, we had to change the TLS version for the CDN. And so we had to ensure for compliance reasons that we were only using TLS 1.2. Um, and so unfortunately, um, if you aren't using TLS 1.2 on your client, um, any other versions, then you're going to encounter an issue um, where PowerShell Git is going to say that it wasn't able uh, to find the NuGet provider, and it's going to ask if you want to install the NuGet provider. And it gives you two options. One is to just hit Y and say, like, yes, PowerShell Git, please install this for me. And the other option is to actually run the commandlet install NuGet provider. Um, and both of those fail, unfortunately, and I know that this has been a source of frustration for a number of users. Um, so there's two options to resolve this issue. One is to just change your TLS version to 1.2. This is the simplest thing to do, and there's two ways to go about this. You can just uh, change it for your current PowerShell session, um, or there's some more in-depth instructions on how to actually change it permanently on um, the system. Um, and the other option, if for some reason you can't actually change the TLS version, you can always manually download um, package management and the NuGet provider from the gallery. There's just the manual download option um, on the gallery UI. Um, so there's always the option to, to do that. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to update both PowerShell Get and package management to the latest stable versions. Um, we actually do handle any uh, TLS changes there um, within version 2.2.5 um, of PowerShell Get. So I just wanted to um, mention that, and we do have a blog post that is out today. Um, it's called When PowerShell Get V1 Fails to Install the NuGet Provider. Um, and we will, I know Steve already posted that on Twitter. I will post um, this blog post on Twitter as well. So if you encounter this issue or happen to encounter this issue in the future, uh, just 
feel free to refer to this blog post on how to fix it. And that's all. Well, great, thank you, Amber. I, I did see a question scroll by in the chats that you might get a chance to take a look at. Oh, they're scrolling by yeah, really quick. Let me... so I, I Jason, there's a, there's a hand raised as well. <clears throat> oh, who has their hand raised? I don't see the hand raised. Uh, it's a Victor. If you want to unmute real quick and ask your question, or put it in chat. Oh, I'm not hearing anything from Victor. Hey, Victor, feel free to put it in chat, or if you want to just uh, pop online with us. Oh, mistake. Okay, not a problem. Cool. Okay, yeah, well, if anyone has questions, I can just respond in the chat. Cool, thank you, Amber. Um, moving on Thanks. to our next agenda item is DSC Docs. But before we do, I, I noticed a couple of questions about DSC, and I just kind of wanted to give a quick summary of where we're uh, at and where we're headed with it. I think I talked a little bit about this uh, towards the end of last year, uh, but for DSC and specifically DSC v3, one of the things that we're doing is we're going to open source the DSC repo now that we've taken DSC back, and that's one of the things that we're working towards. I don't have any, uh, a, a date for you yet, but we've been thinking about spring around the build time frame, and so that's kind of what we're working towards for release on that. Part of that, as we're working towards that, is to update the documentation, and I want to I want to hand it over to Sean here in just a second so that he can tell you about the work that we've been doing to start to move and update that documentation. But what we expect also in this time frame, as we're getting ready to open source the DSC repo is we expect to come out with a roadmap. We have some items that we'd like to look at going forward with DSC uh, V3, and we'd like to talk to you about it. We finished out some work that we were doing for DSC V3 for Azure Policy Guest Config. We have some more that we might be doing in there. Plus, we want to start looking at going forward. So we will be having those communications with the community, especially in the DSC community call. If you haven't been to that, please go to that. Um, and also here as well, and we will post a roadmap moving forward. Having said that, we did start uh, taking care of some documentations for DSC. And Sean, do you want to uh, take a second and tell us what you've been up to? I know you're here somewhere, Sean. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the you may have noticed in the PowerShell doc set um, the documentation for DSC. Um, has been drastically reduced. <clears throat> what um, with the release of PowerShell 7.2, the PS Desired State configuration module was removed and now ships on the gallery. This was sort of the first step of this transition. Um, and <clears throat> um, the next thing was um, managing the DSC documentation. So there's three versions of the documentation that's now over at this URL, docs.microsoft.com slash PowerShell slash DSC. Um, and if you switch to the um, DSC 1.1 documentation, this is all of the um, existing documentation that was in the PowerShell doc set. This documents the version of um, DSC that ships in Windows PowerShell 5.1. This content hasn't changed. Um, and then switching to 2.0, this is uh, mostly about the uh, the desired state configuration module itself and the commandlets that are available there. And then we have some new preview content for 3.0. Um, Michael Green's created a couple of um, uh, new articles here talking about this, but what this does is um, moving this content out to a, a new repo and a new uh, publishing location on the docs platform uh, will allow us to iterate on this and um, document the DSC version specific uh, differences separate from PowerShell itself. So, um, Stay tuned, there's more work coming here. 
That's awesome, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, we are continuing to move forward on DSEV3. And so tell your friends, we, Sean and I, and the rest of the team, we look forward to both your documentation issues and your feedback on DSEV3 as we move forward. Um, moving on, first of all, uh, Damien Caro has, has, has officially kind of joined our team coming over from DevRel. And this is great because you've probably seen Damien talk about Azure PowerShell and the predictor AZ tools uh, that, they, that he's been working on. But today, Damien, you're going to talk to us about something just as critical as everything else, which is Azure PowerShell and Graph. <clears throat> yes, the integration or the change we've done around the Graph API, the Microsoft Graph API, is switching from Azure AD to Microsoft Graph. Oh, let me share my screen. Awesome. I wasn't sure I was next on the agenda. <laughs> So I just wanted to go through um, a quick story around how we did that. Um, and keep me honest, uh, Jason, I have like five, ten minutes. Sure. OK. Um, so I just want to tell you a bit uh, about the story we went through, uh, what we did for the AZ8 commandlets. And I'm going to reduce to those commandlets, even though we did more than just the migration of the AZ8 commandlets. Um, so there are a few things that uh, kicked in to help or support that, that migration. The first one is that the Azure AD Graph API, which is used by Azure RM and the older version of AZ, is going to retire or has been announced retired on June 30, 2022, which means less than six months from now, more like five months. Uh, the impact when we looked at that uh, retirement of the API, we assessed the impact, and it really touched all the AZAD command in AZ.resources, but it also has impact on some service modules, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but we're using the Azure AD uh, API when we create an AKS cluster, for example. Um, we also had a bunch of requests coming that are asking us to support more resources in the AZAD world, like how do you expand all capabilities for users and stuff like that, and how we could be ready for the future. And finally, uh, we looked at how we could address that retirement plan, and if we could do a joint effort with the Microsoft Graph SDK module, which unfortunately brought a lot of challenges. Um, it's breaking change in terms of commands, so the command signature. It brings more complexity in how you manage those resources in Azure AD, as well as the language, the query language, which is different than what we had in a in ZAD commandlet. The size could also be a problem. Um, the Microsoft Graph for users and applications and groups starts to add up when you add all of them. Uh, not that Azure per se is, is small, but it just added on the on the existing size. And and furthermore, um, there is a there is a, a, a way that the Graph SDK module is being built that prevents us from having an SSO experience with Azure or AZ as it is today. Um, so taking all those considerations together, we decided to rework those Azure AD a commandlet that we expose, and we try to drive the change with a few principles. The first one was ensuring that we would give as much time as we could to our customers to do the migration but at the same time, limiting the breaking change as much as possible. Um, by as much as possible, um, there are some changes that are unfortunately uh, a different change in the API response, for example, and we cannot hide that. There's no way we were going to be transforming object returned by the API to something else, because we also wanted to be as close as possible to the API behavior. Um, so the other aspect that we wanted to drive for was ensuring we could generate um, the module based on the Swagger specification and be able to update as fast as we could uh, when the API evolves. Uh, and that was in order to have that alignment with the graph module. So having all those things together, let us generate a new version of, of AZ.resources 
or update AZ.resources, and we included that into AZ7. So if you're following a bit the sequence and the, the generations we have in AZ, we released AZ7 early December um, in order to give that six month period for you to try out, to plan the work um, before the endpoint re retire. Uh, AZ7 is now using Graph. We have completed um, um, the work on Key Vault, AKS, SQL, resources, and I'm just realizing I'm missing one here, uh, Synapse. So all of those modules have migrated to Microsoft Graph under the cover. It's, it's, it's something that is so totally transparent. Uh, so those modules have not gone through any change. It just instead of calling the Azure AD API, they, they pretty much call the um, Microsoft Graph API now. Um, there are two modules that are working on the migration, and the main reason is the service team owns that work and they've been a little behind. Um, Storage Sync and AG Insights are doing the work um, in the in this in this month, in the in the coming months. Uh, the change is going to be transparent. It's not going to have any impact on 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 scripts or anything. It's it's literally uh, a change under the under the cover. Now, um, we have released 7.1 and we are still working on a couple of issues that we have missed during our test and, and all the, the previews we've done before. Um, we may still have few issues. So if you find one as you do your migration, please open issues on the repo on the github.com Azure, Azure PowerShell. This is where we look at issues and and we prioritize the work on those graph-related items. Uh, we try to solve them right away in the existing sprint, so which means that in the next release, it's going to be uh, addressed. <clears throat> We're still working on a couple of things around documentation. Um, one of the uh, work that we have pending is clarifying a bit and positioning better how and when you want to use AZ uh, versus Microsoft Graph, versus Azure AD and, and Microsoft Online, those other modules that um, are related to the Azure AD API and, and the helping, helping you understand um, when you want to use what and what are the boundaries of each. Few resources uh, that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, the first one is uh, the migration guide. So we have a migration guide that lists out all the breaking change uh, all the changes that are coming with that Microsoft, um, that AZ resources uh, in AZ7. Um, it goes through all those command change. It goes through all the object return um, property that have changed. Um, we have a couple of technical of blog articles that describes a bit better our strategy in more details, where we are going and what is our plan. And finally, two calls to action. Um, the first one is, Open issues when you have a problem, we are looking at them, we fix them. And the second one is plan your migration as soon as you can, um, because that's where uh, we don't want you to be at the cutting edge or on the, on the very uh, near term when the API retires. So plan that migration. And that's, that's it. I haven't hey, Damien, a question from the chat for you. And this comes in from uh, James was saying that he was cool with the changes to the graph stuff, but the biggest win would be if he could drop the, a the Azure AD module um, so we didn't have to flip to the old shell. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the Azure AD is, is a module. Um, we, we know that the, the, the challenge, the identity team is working on a solution to help migrating from Azure AD to the full Microsoft graph. Um, it's unfortunately not in my hands, but but that's that's the status of the work being done over there. Cool, thank you. Please continue to go ahead and either post your questions to the GitHub site or to right here in chat. Um, Cindy, um, do we have? I'm I'm looking for our community demo. I'm not sure. Oh, Chris. I'm seeing Chris. Yeah, Chris, are yeah. you you good to do this? Uh, yeah, I think it just need to be promoted to be a presenter so I could share a screen. Is that possible? 
I think Steve has the power to do that. Uh, oh, I got it. You got it? Okay, cool. Uh, try that. Yeah, see it coming through. Thank you. Already done. Thank you. So it should be coming through in a second. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, so I want to talk a bit here about GitHub code spaces and how you set in a very simple module. Um, the reason why that is possible sharing now with the partial community is because it has matured quite a bit. The technology is relying on something called Dev Container, which has actually been around there for two years. And I've actually used it in this module in all the two years, and it was still working without any changes. Um, and originally it was pitched more for developers, where it got complex builds that only work on a certain machine and lots of bootstrapping actions. Um, but actually even for lots of partial admins, it does make sense to use it especially when you think about installing system-wide dependencies, um, modules, and you don't want your machine to be in two states. Um, or if you develop your modules so that you could fix your development environment, even when it's just simple partial modules. So I'm using this Porsche CLI module here, which is a meta module. So the idea is when it comes to tab completion modules, um, like, for example, there is Posh Git that can give you tab completion for Git, but also various other ones. You want to have all of the bootstrap that you need, um, and the tool automatically discovers which command lines you've got installed. Maybe you've got the EZ CLI installed, etc., and then installs the relevant um, PowerShell module to get you going. Um, so let me just open this in the code space here. And by the way, if you don't want to pay the license fee or your organization doesn't support that, the technology set is dev container, and that is free when you run it locally using Docker. So it has brought up this new machine here. If I was to type just, uh, I don't know, git checkout, and I don't want to type it out and I press tab, nothing is happening. Well, what I do here first is install it, and then just run install tab completion. And this is not intended to be a demo really of this module, but what I'm demonstrating here is I'm in a vanilla machine, and I kind of run my tests that do lots of things like uninstalling modules, reinstalling them, things that I wouldn't like to do with my local machine. Um, and I can use just this dev space, create new ones, I can have multiple ones. So as it's installing this one, let's give it a few seconds. We should see that Git would now autocomplete. So now if I press tab, then it autocompletes and shows me the different options there. And it's actually quite easy to configure. It just relies on this .dev container folder where you configure your Docker file. And although initially it can be a bit daunting, especially as a developer, if you just go from the vanilla partial image, sometimes you just need to have something like this that you copy paste that gives you things like Git that can be useful, especially when you work in a code repository, or maybe you bootstrap pester. So it's quite easy and you can probably copy paste this and use it across all your other, other modules and it will probably be sufficient for your work. Um, you can have configure your shell, in this case I'm using it, so that PowerShell automatically comes up and not the default, which would be bash. I can ask it to install the PowerShell extension or any extension that I wish, and that means at a click of a button, I could say create code space, and in a minute it would create me a new one, and it would be like a new machine that I can use. Um, and I think that that is quite useful because you can quickly create new things, tear them down, um, and not worry about polluting your local machine and changing the state of your machine when you experiment maybe with different modules. Um, so, so yeah, so the DD is use, use this for like quick development, especially when you touch things that you would be very cautious of touching, didn't, wouldn't want touching. Um, and yeah, 
I don't know if there's any questions with that, but I thought it's it's a cool, simple demo where the technology that's more aimed for developers can be used by an admin as well without really too much overhead or really knowing how things work behind the scenes. That's also awesome. cool, Chris. Chris, there is some um, chat about related topics that maybe you want to just um, look at in the chat window. Um, I'll take a look. Is it the question around script analyzer? There's no, a no, no, that's a, that's a different comments. thing. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to questions. <laughs> Speaking of questions, and Sydney, I can use your uh, some of your help here, but I think I got the first four that I can run through real quick. Okay, um, yeah, I'll just make a quick comment too, which is that um, I really love all the discussion in the chat, been like trying to take notes and also like keep an eye on all of that. Um, really appreciate all the enthusiasm. I will also say, and maybe Jason, you don't agree, we've tried to like keep an eye on questions throughout and a lot of questions have already been answered in the chat, but feel free to repost your question if you feel like it hasn't adequately gotten answered at this point um, so we can keep the queue going. But yeah, uh, it looks like we also had some preloaded questions and questions in the GitHub issue. So Jason, I don't know if you wanna take it from there sure, or if I you had some Slack questions ready. Yeah, I'll cover some of the GitHub issues real quick. And and Cindy, I do totally agree with you. So yes, everybody, if your issue doesn't get answered, please post. Um, you can drop it in the issue. You can also, if you think of it later, you can also post it right to our GitHub or ask us direct. So um, one of the first questions was, the first question will be, how was the holidays? I'll answer for myself. Great. Next of a question from Kevin was, uh, what does the uh, roadmap for DSC look like? Yeah, and this is what I was talking about was that uh, we'll be coming out with that. And I, I did already kind of go through what our, our current plans are as we open source the repo, and we will be having that conversation with you soon. Uh, Chris Burgermeister, oh yeah, yeah. I hope I can attend and will try to motivate myself to do a small community demo of Posh CLI. Chris, thank you so much. I think you have people converting um, as they're making that statement. Um, and the next one that I was gonna answer real quick was any updates on um, Platy PS uh, V2, um, there's a PSSA V2. I'm not even sure what that is, but the Platy PS V2. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Did no, no, PSSA is the script analyzer. We could have uh, Jim, I think, is on the call. Maybe you can just talk briefly about that. Yeah, Jim, are you around? If not, I can also take that one. Oh, well, I don't Please go it. for it, Sydney. Okay, cool. Yeah, so. If you've been around a while, you've heard of our PSSA V2 project that we were really exploring. I would say we were um, about a little over a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, we kind of kicked off exploration around that project. And that was a rewrite of um, PSSA or Script Analyzer. Um, in the meantime, we have prioritized other projects. Um, that's kind of the short answer. Uh, uh, you can see that work, especially in um, the work we've put into the VS Code extension. Um, I think there's still potential for PSSA uh, to uh, have a major rewrite, to, to have a really big impact. It is an important module to our community. It is used heavily in the VS Code extension. Um, and at least I can I can speak personally and say that I think that the compatibility rules um, and custom rules are a huge um, opportunity for our community that um, hasn't been fully like gotten to a mature state. Um, that being said, um, I will also like shout out Chris, um, who just gave the demo, Chris Bergmeister. Um, he does a ton of work in the PSSA repo and has um, kept us moving with uh, continual releases sort of on the 1.0 train. Um, we're active in that repo, triaging all the time, talking about when our next release will be, but just haven't had the resources to invest in the 2.0 project um, thus far. Let me just add um, one quick thing on that real quick. So so the original motivation um, for looking at PSSA 2 was really about performance, specifically in the context of VS Code, because VS Code relies heavily on um, Script Analyzer. Um, we were able to kind of solve some of the perf issues in the uh, extension through other means. So that because of that, that deprioritized um, some of the effort in a V2. And we'll, we'll definitely revisit that when the time comes, but the team is uh, pretty busy with a lot of things right now. I also want to add that I'm working on moving documentation out of the source repo into the docs platform. Um, so more to come on that as things progress. And Jason, and can, about, yeah, you want to talk about Platypus? Yeah, yeah let me talk about Platypus and, and the DTS on the call. So DTO, feel free to jump in on this. 
Um, so for Platypus uh, V2, where we're currently at is we are, uh, keep in mind that the, the work that we're doing on PlatyPS also ties into the work that we do for the help pipelines. You may have heard me talk about those in the past. Those help pipelines are what um, put together and ships the PowerShell help that you get when you run update help. The work that we're doing on Platypus V2, we're coming up to our preview two of this. We pretty much front loaded the work for the help pipeline, build scenarios, um, here, we are trying to get the build pipeline converted over to the, the latest uh, version of Platy PS so that we can make sure we get lots of testing done on it. So our preview, too, is we'll get a blog out. We're coming up towards the end of this month, maybe the beginning of February. You'll see the blog come out. We'll have it released. Uh, we've got a couple of new commandments. I don't have them in front of my, my face right now that we've updated that we'll be doing for this. So we'll have more information uh, out for you over that. And then we uh, will be moving forward on our next couple of previews as we work towards the GA for Platy PS. Oh, yeah, the two commandments that are coming up uh, in the next preview are update uh, Markdown help and update Markdown help module. Oh, great. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, let me cover the next item real quick. This is about single file executable, whether or not the PowerShell team has an interest in supporting it. So with .NET 5, um, what was it, .NET 6? I think .NET 5 had a preview. .NET 6 has it full support um, to basically compile a, a C-sharp application to a single XC, although it's not exactly single XC on Windows, but it is on Linux and Mac OS. Anyways, um, we know that uh, there are some ch uh, problems today if you actually change the PowerShell repo build scripts to try to produce a single XE. It will build, but it won't run because you'll get some uh, type initializer exception. Uh, and I think Aditya had looked into it. I also looked into it. I was trying to do my own experiment for other reasons. Um, so the short answer, and I, the committee did talk about it last night. So our position is we are primarily interested in it to support any community projects that are single XE that needs to host PowerShell, because that doesn't work either. And, and we would definitely want to uh, fix that. Whether or not we would ourselves publish a single XE package is a different question. Um, right now, there's a manual cost involved for the team to kind of um, support more distros and more packages. So right now, we're, um, as mentioned earlier, we're trying to focus on a lot of our infrastructure work so that we can actually be more like VS Code extension and release more often and, and more cheaply, but it is kind of expensive to do a release and supporting another package, which would not necessarily replace the existing packages, um, is not a priority right now. So the short answer is if we can get a community member or members to kind of submit a PR to fix any outstanding issues for producing a single XE, we would happily spend effort to review that PR, um, again, to unblock customers, but we would not necessarily at this time produce a single XE package. All right, and then uh, I'm gonna go to the next one as well about working groups. So we are planning on reviewing, actually, let me double click on, let me open this issue, make sure it's the same one I'm thinking about. Uh, yes, okay. So that is, um, so last year, I think I made a call to see if there are other community members who'd be interested in joining working groups. So that is on the agenda for the committee uh, meeting next week. We meet every Wednesday. So hopefully we'll have an update on that after there's some discussion within the committee. Uh, and then I, uh, for the next, Travis, I think Travis is on the call, right? Travis, are you here to talk about Microsoft Update? Uh, yeah, I can talk about Microsoft Update. Um, um, yeah, I've been out and um, we kind of got paused because of outage during that. Uh, I can, we have some work that has to get done and then I'll pick up that work. I don't have an exact date to get that out. Uh, we'll have to work with Windows to reschedule a date. Yeah, to summarize, there are um, certain blackout dates um, because people are not available on the Windows side during the holidays. So, uh, and some of our own folks are also out, right? So uh, that will resume. Uh, the last question I see from Kevin is about semantic version. So we are avoiding doing any semantic version work until .NET itself officially supports it. Um, last I saw, they kept adding it to like future, but I don't know if they're ever actually going to do it. But uh, we want to avoid having a PowerShell specific implementation and then having conflicts with the .NET official versions, some official semantic version type. So uh, I guess for now, that's still pending until they do that work. 
with the few minutes that we have left, I'd like to just open the floor if you want to type in a question into the chat or into the GitHub issue, or if somebody from the team or someone wants to make an additional announcement or have a conversation, we have a couple of minutes. So I'm just wasting some air time as you type in your questions. Hey, Jason. So I just wanted to add something regarding uh, the preview versioning support. So Joel yeah. had asked um, a question in the chat, and I think I misspoke. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick. Um, so when you're looking at uh, version 3.0.0 preview, he or they had asked if 3.0.0 A would let you still uninstall 3.0.0 preview. And I did check, and actually, it does work. So it just sees that A is less than B, and then lets you un uninstall. Um, you can actually uninstall and, or sorry, you can actually use the wildcard character. You can use star. Um, and I think I'm going to say that you can use star because it doesn't actually have wildcard support. Um, I believe it just takes, I don't know, like the alphanumeric value, perhaps, of star. And then it sees that it's less than P, and it lets you uninstall. Um, so something like, 3.0.0 dash P dash or P star view wouldn't work. So it's not like you actually have wildcard support when it comes to the preview label in the version, but it does uh, let you use letters or alphanumeric characters, I believe, that are less than the version, or sorry, less than the pre-release tag you're looking to uninstall. So I just wanted to clarify that. Oh, great. Thanks, Anam. Appreciate yeah, that. Of course. So, good catch. With Thank you for pointing that out, Joel. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to give us a few seconds in case someone else would like to comment. Um, while we see, just as a reminder, um, again, uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, attending this January call. And as a reminder, of course, we do this every month and we'll have one next month. And yeah, we'll update everybody on what's going on with Mo. I'll work with Travis on that. And with that, I think I'm gonna to start to bring us to a close. Again, thank you very much for attending this January PowerShell community call. We look forward to seeing you in February as we'll provide more updates, and we look forward to your questions and to work with you. Thanks so much. See you on GitHub. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.